a load of meaningless ponderings. Why meaningless? Because before I begin to display these ponderings, I would like to say that none of them will ever assist in attaining enlightenment and won't assist us at all. In fact, to the, on the contrary, pondering about things is precisely one of the uh, major factors of dualistic linear thought which conditions and prevents us from enlightenment. And so, uh, to ponder upon the things I am about to discuss is meaningless in the context of if what one is trying to achieve is makkah or eightfold path or arahantship or if you like Buddhism, uh, Buddhahood, uh, enlightenment, uh, purity from defilement, liberation, moksha, uh, nibbana, nirvana, bliss. If that is what one is trying to achieve, uh, when a practitioner really is trying to achieve that, then it becomes a 24 hour, seven days a week, 365 days a year pastime called mindfulness and hopefully insight which will arise from concentration that arises from the effort of maintaining and sustaining mindfulness of what one is doing, saying, thinking, feeling, intending, concocting. And so, to ponder about the ifs and buts and wherefores of things and if it had been like this or that and things which one cannot confirm and which even if one can confirm will not bring one one step further towards enlightenment, if you want to call it that, then uh, it's meaningless pondering. And in Vipassana it's called Vichikicca, which uh, we call Vijan. Mm. We call it to analyze and Vijan is to conclude. So analytical thought with judgments being made based upon those dualistic, linear, analytical thought processes that name things as conditioned individual separate objects like a table, a person, Fred, uh, the party, the, th the show, my birthday, uh, a house, the laws of physics, all dhammas, all phenomena. So, only when we stop pondering can enlightenment begin to become possible. So, this talk is a load of meaningless ponderings. But these ponderings, I shall ponder for you who wish to listen. If there is anybody wishing to listen, then I will ponder them because Although it is when you have left pondering that you can begin to tread the path towards enlightenment, one cannot leave pondering and tread that path until one has pondered this and various other questions or issues. And so it's a catch-22, which is very much a classic element of the practice of vipassana, that there's a lot of catch-22. Uh, for It's like a box trying to turn itself up inside out. Yeah? All we have is a conditioned mind, and we're trying to attain an enlightened, non-conditioned mind. But if all that you have is an unenlightened, conditioned mind to work with, then you don't have anything outside of that with which you can break out with. So the only thing you can use to break out of illusion with is various models and thought processes and little mental tricks and tricks of practice, ways of making effort, ways of finding reasons to have the wish to make effort 
to change something or do something or attain something. That's called cultivating the causes, cultivating the causes of change within oneself. And that is, in truth, the practice of vipassana, of self-transformation. But not only, it is part of the practice of vipassana. Self-transformation can be practiced and realized without vipassana. But vipassana, as a Buddhist practice of 40 categories, but vipassana as a translated from the uh, Prakrit or Sanskrit as insight cultivation or uh, inner vision cultivation uh, or super sight, special sight, spiritual vision, third eye, call it what you want, that's all conditioned. Don't forget we're trying to break out of the conditioned with all this material nonsense, all this meaning, bunch of meaningless ponderings. Because a bunch of meaningless ponderings is the only thing we can use as a tool to find our way out of the mental labyrinth of illusory existence, which some people call samsara, samsara, or maya, illusion, that is precisely the act of pondering and naming things. And so one has to ponder to come across the fact that one needs to stop pondering in order to figure out the answer to that which one is pondering about. <laughs> Sounds like an Alan Watts uh, wordsmith juggle. He likes to, he's a wordsmith too and he likes to juggle. In fact, he's who inspired me to start recording these things. So. And he also juggles a lot of uh, pointless nonsense, but which is necessary. That's also a very nice way to phrase it. It's pointless nonsense, but it is also necessary because you have to get through the pointless nonsense in order to get to the true sense of things. And so I am about to begin this particular issue or topic and make some... Uh, senseless meandering ponderings about it so that one can put an end to it and hopefully when one has pondered enough issues and seen in meditation and with insight that there is an infinite number of inventable or discoverable issues which can be pondered upon that one cannot ponder upon and conclude the answer to everything because it simply does never end, and that is also part of never-ending existence in the rebirth in the realms of samsara, of illusion, and birth, aging, sickness, pain, suffering, sadness, loss, death, <clears throat> and entrapment in that cycle. And so, the one I want to ponder about today is about the Buddha, uh, his reasons for not immediately, instantly going to Nibbana and for remaining in a physical body which is subject to the sufferings of samsara and of the five khandas or the skandhas of rup, vetana, sanya, sankhan, vinyan, rupa, vetana, sanya, sankara and vinyana form, feelings, perception and memory, conditioned thoughts and uh, conditioned imagined thoughts, and awareness, consciousness, the five kandas. And so why he did he remain when he could have gone? He attained arahantship and enlightenment. He could s travel to any place in space and time and in any dimension or celestial realm he could wish to. And so there are stories. One story in Thailand, they like to tell that uh, a very high Mara of the high Brahma levels, so we're talking of a demonic, malefic entity who has attained some of the highest celestial heaven levels of the Brahma, but was a Mara and came down to fight him. Uh, that raises the question of 
Well, if they tell us that if we do bad, then we can never go to heaven, how on earth, or how in heaven, did these powerful Maras get to dwell in such high realms as the Brahma levels? And why are the Asura giants and monsters in one of the highest levels of heaven, being so aggressive and so malefic as many of them are reputed to be? And so with the idea of sin, we have which makes us fear dying, for we have sinned and we will go to hell. For if you have aggression or if you have this and that in your heart, you will never enter heaven. This I do believe. What I do find hard to believe is how evil Maras can exist in the higher heavens. However, through pondering, I found a possible answer. A possible answer is confirmable through the fact that I myself am nowhere near a pure, spotless spiritual being with no blemish and no defilement or no selfishness. And so I have stains on my mind, on my spirit. But I have managed to attain that which I know I have attained. There's no point in telling somebody else or listing it, but... I confirmed for myself that, oh, well, even impure person like me can attain this or that ability or power or uh, special sight or special hearing or special knowledge or special co ability to control elements or various, there's a long list of things that can happen when you tread the path of the practitioner and they cannot be circumvented, the paths of power, the Buddha said, or is reputed to have said, the Itipadas and the Apinya, the special powers, they arise along the path and cannot be circumvented. And all Arahants will have these powers through their realization automatically will arise. Whether they will use them or not is another matter. But there are also impure beings who have attained many of these powers except perhaps that which is arguably only attainable by the pure arahants, which is in Buddhism known as the sixth apinya, because one has to have achieved total, the full meaning of the word upeka and the attainment it means, which means equanimity, but in its fullest, deepest, highest meaning, which one has to study and practice a lot to understand how deep that goes. And so, that's one pondering. That can give you a hundred things to ponder about. So why the Buddha stayed to teach us, and why he remained in his body? Because he had no reason, one story says, and that he was going to go. But that one Brahma came down from a high celestial realm and begged him to stay to teach the humans, and that maybe a human could understand. Because the Buddha thought, that nobody could understand and it was a waste of time trying to explain something so subtle and delicate as the Dhamma he had discovered, which he had not invented, but he had discovered. And uh, so in the story he stops and thinks first of his two Rusi or Lursi, Rishi, Yogic, uh, Vedic teachers, and they had died already. And then he thought of the five X. Uh, students, the Panjavaki, and that he would go and tell them, and so on, and so on, and that this is why he stayed. Well, staying to explain is one reason which, not being an Arahant, uh, but having walked the path to certain points, I can already even think myself that if I were free of this, that and the other, and there was nothing left to resolve with myself, then perhaps if I ask myself, shall I stay or should I go? Then I would already find a logical uh, and non-entangled reason for staying. And also just simply for the reason not only for teaching others, which is a bodhisattva, who I, I call the Buddha Bodhisattva, compassionate Buddha, 
but also because with this human body, even if you are enlightened, you can use that body to learn and experience lots of things, which even enlightened beings, although they are free of suffering, they have not learned about everything. And so all of the endless list of questions and meaningless ponderings, which one wastes one's time with and evades enlightenment with one's whole life, should actually, if one understands, be cast aside, and one should get down, straight down to the job of enlightening oneself and letting go and disentangling. And here's the catch-22 the catch I mentioned, which comes so often in Dhamma, and in this universe, and in nature, because it is cyclic in nature, and it is self-creating, self-propagating. The catch-22 is that once you have let go of pondering, trying to answer all those non-answerable questions, and become enlightened, <laughs> then, and then, when you've nothing left to do because you've resolved all the issues with yourself, then you can spend eternity learning about everything as it comes along with what you've got at the time. And once your body's gone, of course, the limits are beyond your and my imagination as to how one could develop, investigate and learn as a spiritual being without the limits of human form and with the power of consciousness and the speed of thought and the power of will and no body to chain oneself. I think it will become very magical if one attains that self-knowledge and awareness that is enlightenment. And so, I think we shouldn't worry about the stories, whether the Buddha stayed for this reason, or why an Arahant would stay, or if he would go, or is that story true or not, because it's meaningless ponderings. And it won't get you to Arahantship, to Buddhahood, to enlightenment, to liberation from self-inflicted suffering of the mind and the heart of emotion, and the suffering of physical pain of the body, and the sadnesses of emotion of aging sickness and death and rebirth, and wrong knowledge and wrong deeds through wrong knowledge and regrets, and the suffering of regret through wrong deeds through wrong knowledge. And so may we all become free and attain the happiness that knows no end. And may we attain true equanimity and become Buddhas in the Buddha lands, in the fair lands, be born on a lotus in the next life instantly and only continue in auspicious lifetimes until liberation. Sato, this is Ajahn Spencer signing off.